That was the last song we sang, wasn't it, Alan? That was the last song we sang together. We're going to listen to the scriptures. This is a reading that comes out of the Bible from Proverbs, chapter 31. Judge or arbiter. He looked at the crowd and said, 
Avoid greed in all its forms. Your life isn't made more secure by what you own, or even when you have more than you need. Jesus told them a parable in these words. There was a rich farmer who had a good harvest. What will I do with the farmer mused? I have no place to store my harvest. I know I'll pull down my grain bins and no larger ones. All the grain and the goods will go there. Then I'll say to myself, you have blessings in reserve for many years to come. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to the farmer, you foolish one, this very night your life is expected of you. To whom will all your accumulated wealth go? This is the way it works with people who accumulate riches only for themselves and are not rich in God. Then he said to his disciples, That's why I tell you, don't worry about your life, what you are to eat. Don't worry about your body, what you are to wear. For life is more than food, and the body is more than clothing. Take a lesson from the ravens. They don't sow or reap. They have neither a cellar nor a barn, yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable are you than a bird? Can any of you, for all your worrying, add a single hour to your life? Even if the smallest things are beyond your control, why worry about all the rest? Notice how the flowers grow. They neither labor nor weave, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his splendor was not robed like one of these. If that's how God clothes the grass in the field, which is here today and thrown in the fire tomorrow, how much more will God look after you? So you have little faith. As for you, don't set your hearts on what you'll eat or drink. Stop worrying. All the nations of this world seek these things, and yet God knows well what you need. Set your sights on the kingdom of God, and all these other things will be given you as well. Fear not, little flock. It has pleased God to give you the kingdom. Sell what you have, give the money to the poor. Make purses for yourselves that don't wear out, treasures that won't fail you in heaven, so that the thieves cannot steal or the moths destroy. For whatever your treasure is, that is where your heart is. This gospel and the reading about a good wife very much reflect Jane's life, doesn't it, huh? Yeah. So we shared about who she was and how she cared about people and gave of her time. Whether it was knitting one of those long afghans, who does that these days, huh? Who sits still for a minute even to do it? There was a, a speaker who says, you know, there's two different kinds of virtues. We have virtues, like if you're trying to get a job, and you have to say, well, I do this, I did this, I went to school there. These are what I can do as compared to what are our virtues when we're here at a funeral? This is a time for all of us to say, what will they say about me? What are the virtues about my character, about my personality, about the relationships? And isn't it Jane? Represents the best, huh? She welcomed, right? She cared. She took in another family, didn't she? Yeah. And now we've got grandchildren, great-grandchildren, Maybe she learned it from the bikers to be generous, outgoing, caring about people. Good charity runs, right, Al? Yeah. Charity runs. That's what we were doing. And that means we kept an eye out for others. That's what the kingdom of God is. Paying attention, taking care of this creation and those given to us. Well, I hope these words and some of the other sharing that we will do will help us to especially celebrate Jane's life. I was, of course, honored a week ago to go up to the house, and Ellen was there, taking her right down to the very end. And the best part of the house,
ask his car. He could be right there at the house. Of course, you have a little other help, but you were there, Alan. You're a sign of dedicated faithfulness. We need that this time. You know, even when your back hurts, and, you know, things aren't easy, right? So what I want to do is have the family share a little bit. I'm going to look at this obituary with you just to get a perspective. Maybe some of you know, she was born in Chicago, yeah. up till 15 years old, and then went to the wild town of Wild Rose, huh? <laughs> way up there, north of rain, up in the boondocks. Huh? How can you live out there? I don't know. <laughs> How many people is it? 50 people, 100 people? Not too big. So then we had to move to the big city. Now we know Williston is a thriving metropolis. Uh, but then so much time at the lake, a little bit of time. Coming closer. Let's look at this. I'm going to read through this. So we've got she was, she was born to Clifford and Anna. Anna's an important name, isn't it? It's given to both kids. Uh, Coon in Chicago, July 4, 1945. Raised in Chicago until the age of 15. Then they moved up to Wild Rose. She graduated from Wild Rose High School. She settled in Williston in 91, she married this young fellow, Alan, and they built that home in Williston and then moved out to Lake Street. And then I am here with some of the neighbors. Which of the neighbors are here up where they live? Up on uh, what is this view? Okay, now. Okay. Good, we've got a few neighbors here. Now. She enjoyed making crafts, hobby club, an expert crocheter, and countless Afghans. Loved ones, she made them for just only them, but mostly riding a motorcycle. You didn't bring your spider today, Ellen. I think of her every time you look at it. Soaking up time with this wonderful family, but especially at Christmas, Thanksgiving, holidays, huh? yeah. and the light that those seasons give us. It represented her faith as well as her. So she was a member of the Basin. We were looking at the bear picture, right? Basin bear. And the couple that rode many charity rides, giving their friendship to the community, shared laughter and good conversation. Okay, what I think we do first, just turn to one person, share one little story about James and Jane Allen, anything you can remember, just with one person's that. What, what ride were you on or something? Take a minute for that.
The years that followed were filled with good times and a dash of chaos. Um, as we blended families through holidays and family vacations, we had a blast camping at Glacier, Black Hills. Jane had a great love for nature, whether appreciating the beauty of the mountains, lakes, and streams, or the gardens and animals in her own backyard. At the lake house, she set up an amazing feeder that brought deer, squirrels, birds, and more. She loved sharing her yard with animals and delighted in watching them. Jean truly enjoyed being a homemaker. She turned cleaning and organizing into an art form. In fact, I just found out just last night with some awesome reminiscing that she used to throw on some ABBA and sing and dance to work her way to a clean house. And I'm not going to lie, I'm going to be trying this at all. <laughs> I always remember Jane having a beautiful vegetable and flower garden. And she enjoyed tending her garden and preparing her food for storage by blanching and freezing and canning. So she always had something in the freezer that was fresh from the garden, ready to go. When she had apple trees, she'd make countless batches of applesauce and apple crisp, um, other things she made that we loved, uh, homemade donuts, peanut butter cups, seven-layer bars, red, red cinnamon glass candy. She was an avid crafter, of course. We've mentioned that a few times. A long time member of the local hobby club. The hobby club was more than just crafts, but she did love the crafts. She loved the friendship and the coffee hour. <laughs> but they painted, assembled, glued, stitched, knit, crocheted. And she was especially skilled at crocheting and very proud of that. Um, she loved to make afghans, as we've mentioned, to share with friends. Jane loved a good laugh till you cry kind of laugh. <laughs> we find that usually is brought on by extreme silliness. Um, she loved to dance. In her heyday, and she, she enjoyed a good party, drinking Bacardi Cokes and dancing the night away. Jane was a special lady. She had a big love for all her people. Whether you were family, by love, or by friendship, she cared about you deeply. So many of those folks are gathered here today, and it has been an absolute treasure to come together in her honor and reverence. We'll miss you, Jane. Gone but not forgotten. May you rest in peace. So my name is Jasad. I'm uh, Larissa's husband. Grand, she's the granddaughter of Jane, and uh, she's very special to me because, out of long story short, Larissa and I didn't have the smoothest time entering into the family, and uh, she was very loving her and Grandpa Alan and opening their home to us. And so, uh, from them and their side of the family, opened doors to more of the other family opening up. To us, and so part of that was my own fault, but thank God for their grace. Um, Grandma, I've known her for seven years, and for the time that I had with her, I, it was a privilege to see her grow in her faith, and she was not afraid to have deep conversations with me about faith and ask questions, tough questions. And uh, so, in loving memory of my grandma, I shared kind of a discourse of kind of our dialogues uh, through Grandma Jane and the other person here, Sophia. If you're familiar with Greek uh, classics, Sophia is wisdom. And so Grandma's having a talk with wisdom, which is a metaphor really for Christ. So uh, here we go. Jane, I can't believe that anyone could be an atheist. I mean, I recently had lunch with some of my good friends, and one of them asked if I, after I asked if he believed God, told me that he was an atheist. And it breaks my heart to hear him say such a, such a thing. How is that even possible to not believe in God? Sophia, I admire your concern for the unbeliever and your willingness to ask your friend a question regarding matters of faith. Now, to answer your question, according to God, there are no atheists. Jane, how can that be? Sophia, King David 
inspired by the Holy Spirit, wrote in Psalm 14.1, The fool says in his heart, there is no God. God does not merely engage in name-calling here, but rather he has decreed in his word that atheism, or any worldview entertaining the non-existence of himself, is foolish. You see, a fool is someone who fails to apply wisdom and knowledge in life. If said wisdom and knowledge is lacking, then that person is not a fool, but is ignorant. Fools suppress the truth in order to embark on their foolish decisions or claims. Psalm 19.1 even testifies that the heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims His handiwork. In other words, creation itself is shouting revelation of God's existence along with the Bible. Also, the Apostle Paul writes in Romans 1 that humanity, or man, in his unrighteousness suppresses the truth about God in his pursuit of idols. You cannot suppress something that you are not aware of. He goes on to say, what can be known about God is evident within them, and that man is without excuse. And so, dear Jane, your friend, like others who profess, or your friend, like other atheists, profess his, professes his suppressed belief in the true and living God that we all know. Jane, so are you saying that man does not have an excuse for not believing in God? Sophia, that is correct or else some of our brothers and sisters in humanity would have an excuse on judgment for not knowing God exists. Jane, wow, that was hard to follow, kind of, but I think I understand. Next question, I know Jesus is the Son of God, commands us to repent and believe in Him, died for sinners like you and me, and that He rose from the dead. But as I draw near to the end of this life, with the anticipation of the resurrection for the next, how do I have peace about my salvation? I feel like I must do more to clean myself up before I pass on. Sophia, you have shared key truths about the gospel, and this feeling of yours is natural for man to feel in his fallen state, but I can assure you, you can have peace. Jane, please explain, but in a way that is less philosophical and more to the point. Sophia, of course, we shall not wander away from what needs to be said. Man cannot add or take away to what Christ has accomplished on the cross. Through his perfect obedience to the law, he represented humanity perfectly before the Father, making himself the only sacrifice capable of atoning for our sins before a thrice holy God. The Apostle John wrote in one of his letters, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us of all sin. Again, all sin is cleansed. Paul also writes in Romans 3.28, We maintain that a man is justified, declared righteous, by faith apart from works of the law. And Ephesians 2.8-9, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and it is not of your own doing, it is a gift from God, not a result of works that anyone should boast. Jane. Then what role do my good works and the law have in a Christian's life? Sophia, Paul writes, or continues in Ephesians, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. That does not mean that the good works make us cleaner or more righteous before God, but that because we have been declared righteous through our faith in what Christ has done for us, we are then enabled by God to do good works out of love for God, our neighbors, and a righteous hatred towards our sin. After all, in response to those who abuse the grace of God to justify their sinful lifestyles, Paul wrote in Romans 6, How can those of us who died to sin continue to live in it? Therefore, like a new flame that has been kindled, and its heat cannot be separated from its light, so is it that one who has living faith cannot separate it from producing good works. As for the law, it has multiple functions, ranging from sharing with us the character of God, to acting as a guardian and a tutor to those of us who thirst for righteousness, need discipline or instruction. More can be said of the law, however, to satisfy your soul with an answer in the context of this conversation, the law primarily serves as a means to point men to Christ by revealing our sin in comparison to the holiness of God. Quote, for whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. James 2.10. James, I think I understand. Although my life was not perf in perfect obedience to the 
law of God, I did strive toward the mark. And now that I am old and weak, I continue to honor God with my words, thoughts, and my last moments that I get to enjoy with friends and family in this life. Oh, how I long to be in a body free of physical ailments and to be in the presence of my Lord and Savior for eternity. I do hope for the salvation of my dear friends, family, and my beloved husband, and that they can enjoy the peace of Christ in this life too. Sophia, the Lord bless you and keep you, Jane, and may he use this hardship in your life to refine you and to remind us all of the finality of this life and to not let eternal matters slip from their minds. May our Lord be praised during hardships and in times of peace, as modeled for us in the book of Job. Amen. Thank you. Certainly, Jane, a woman of faith. I often say when I work in the hospital, as we're getting towards the end, uh, we sometimes are afraid, sometimes we're mostly sad. And most of us have learned through. It's a summary of the teachings of Jesus. Let's pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and bring us our transgressions, as we forgive those who transgress against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us.
think of Christmas and we think of these celebrations. Well, the other song the family mentioned is one by Bon Jovi. Helen, you might remember a couple of lines in there. Uh, it says, uh, she brings home her babe for love, for love. Even though they were having a hard time in the song, it says, but we've got each other, and that's a lot for love. We'll give it a shot. Well, we're halfway there. We're living on a prayer. Take my hand. We'll make it, I swear. Well, live on a prayer. A couple of times, right, on. Yeah, when you were sick. Yeah, and you come through. So we all go through struggles. It's good to have Jane and some that we love, some that loves us. And that's really a sign of what our faith and our love of God is all about. We'll do a blessing on her remains. You did a good job with all those pictures and everything. What can we do? Lord our God, the death of our sister Jane recalls our human condition, the brevity of our lives on earth. But for those of us who believe in your love, that is not the end, nor does it destroy the bonds that you forge in our lives. We share the faith of your son's disciples and the hope of children of God. Bring the light of Christ's resurrection to this time of testing and faith. Pain. We pray for Ellen, for this family, for all those who love Jane. We pray this through Christ our Lord. And Lord, as we remember our dear friend, may you receive her into your kingdom as these ashes is no longer remain with a beautiful life with us. A sign. We ask your blessing <coughs> on all of these memories that this she's given us. And when we cry, we can drink the tears of joy for someone who loves us. We thank you, Jack. We send you to the Lord. May you be one of the first to meet us when the Lord comes. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's sing the Lord's Word.
lunch thing right there, huh? Yeah. You don't have to go anywhere. Thanks for coming, especially from the, the riders. Appreciate you being here. It represents a big part of your life, doesn't it, Alan? Huh? Yeah. Yeah. You want to say anything yet to the group, Alan? I guess I'm going to walk down here. Just, if you want to just stay in the I just want to thank everybody for coming. Um, all of you have been such a big part of James' life and my life. We've had so many great times together, great memories. Um, I guess that's what I wanted to say. Uh, I'm going to say a little blessing on the food here. And as you gather, May it be a sign of sharing together the love that Al and Jane have had, and a sign that we will carry that out wherever we live. We'll ask God's blessing on this food. May everybody nourish us for the journey of living in God's kingdom. Thank you, Al. Thank mm -hmm. you.